you talk about the bhagavad gita and destiny a lot and its profound influence on you but i'm going to walk into jail i saw you there met a few times you've said it was a happy time actually in some of the interviews you've done and yet it is the antithesis of what any of us would consider it would be in our minds hell for most of us so tell us how you acclimatized to that what was going through your mind as you went through it and then please tell us about the shoe <laughs> well it's uh, first if i gave the impression either in the book or in any discussions uh, that prison was a easy time it was not uh, right may have been a defense mechanism in my own part to say yes, very good. it was okay very good. you know um uh, i would say when i was going to prison the thought that kept coming back to me all the time was my my father my father was a freedom fighter who went in and out of jails for 10 years and he as a result of the torture that he got there etc was uh, in in a way uh, a very weakened man you know he had only one lung they had you know they had to take out one lung they had beaten him badly he had one leg one inch shorter than the other because of the way they stitched him up and all that so he was not well in in when i was a teenager and in the last two years of his life he was quite a bit in hospitals and um, i would go after school to uh, go and take him for a walk and he would talk about uh, his time in prison and his the independent struggle and all that and that's the only only time i really got to spend a lot of time with him because he was a journalist and he was never home in the evenings uh, one of the things he firstly he was never angry or bitter about the prison experience he was not angry and bitter at the british or his captors he always had forgiveness throughout and never spoke badly about any of his jailers or anything uh he said one thing that was very it stuck with me which is that you can never control what happens to you but you can control how you react and i was determined to do that i was determined to go into prison saying i'm entering a monastery and i'm going to come out of it a better person physically mentally emotionally spiritually and i conducted myself that way i said i was a political prisoner because i didn't feel i had done anything wrong and i was there because of the signs of the times and i was going to hold my head and hi and the thing about prisons is that actually in the us the the basic amenities are fine is reasonably good food is living quarters are cramped but fine you know there are facilities in terms of walking and doing exercise or things like that there's even entertainment to watch you know you can watch some some hours you can watch tv and so so the the the, the physical existence was fine but you know as they say you know power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely the prison guards have actually absolute power over you and they want to kill your spirit it's not sufficient for them that they just say okay i'm going to guard this guy he's not doing anything right but they want to kill your spirit and so the i spent first 8 9 months in a low security prison and then uh, i was sent to solitary confinement and you asked about that that is i must say the most you know inhuman conditions that i have ever experienced in my life uh i was sent there for a flimsiest of excuses i was sent there because i had a towel which i had wrapped into a cylinder and stitched for a back support it was a towel that i bought from the commissary 
So they sent me to to uh, solitary confinement and to give you a small description of this. It's a cell which is approximately half the size of this stage, a little bit like that. It's completely made out of steel and concrete floor. You have a steel bunk bed in which there is a mattress which has been compressed to like two sheets of plastic. So you're basically sleeping on steel. You have a steel toilet with no toilet seat, no cover. You have a steel wash basin. You have a steel door which is four inches thick and it has a slot in the middle of it and it's locked. And at meal times, they come and unlock the slot and push a tray of food and you have to kind of catch it. If you miss it, you'll pick up the food from the floor. And they take you out for an hour every day to, they're required by law to take you out for an hour. And it, you go out in a sort of in a cage, which is roughly the size of this stage. And you have barbed wire and, and chain link fence all around and on top, as if you're in a, you're a zoo animal being let into a little thing. They handcuff you at the smallest excuse wherever they have to take you. Uh, there is no light in this, there is this tiny slit of a window, but they keep the light on throughout the night, bright fluorescent lights. Uh, the switch, light switch is outside the door, not in, inside, you can't control it. So I can go on and on about what the inhuman conditions were, but I also have to say when I was sent to uh, solitary confinement, which is called the shoe, I had to convince them that they had to let me take the Bhagavad Gita with me. I took two books. One was that, and I said, this is my Bible. You have to, by law, allow me to take it. And the second one was uh, a book on pranayama by Iyengar, and I was trying to learn pranayama through that book. And I read the Bhagavad Gita cover to cover several times during that experience. And just to give you two or three thoughts that were so powerful to me to help me survive. One was, you know, we talked about the Karma Yoga part of it, but another one in chapter two is about the Atma. And the Atma that resides inside you, and it's the one with the universe and that it's everlasting, it never dies. And that whole idea said, what does it matter? I mean, if I even perish in this, you know, I have a part in me that is immortal and it will not die with me, it will always be one with God. It's a very interesting concept, puts everything in perspective. Another interesting idea in Gita that goes through a lot is about action with detachment. You're supposed to detach yourself from many things. I mean, not only worldly things, but relationships with success, with power, with all of that. And that gives you a perspective to say, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you almost have outer body experience. You're detached to what is happening to you. The last one that is very interesting is also equanimity. That you should have the ability to actually be equanimous, whether you're going through happy times, sad times, a lot of sorrow, a lot of joy, whatever. It's all the same. Life is a series of experiences. Nothing is inherently good or bad. It's what you make of it. So a lot of these ideas floated around and you thought about it and that, that is what helped me cope with it.